Next up, we have Arbok. It speaks to the power of the Pokemon anime that this is one of the most iconic Pokemon in the franchise by virtue of being Jesse's primary Pokemon in the Indigo League. Arbok also inspired the light in young children everywhere when they realized it and its pre-evolution Ekans' names were respectively Cobra and Snake spelled backwards, albeit with a K. Furthermore, we must mention the terrifying markings on its hood, as it would be the stuff of nightmares if we hadn't seen Pikachu Thunderbolted a million times, making it a lot less scary. Finally, Arbok is the last Pokemon listed in the Pokerap, which is fitting as with this video, we have covered every fully evolved Kanto Pokemon here on False Wipe Gaming, and we thank you for sticking with us thus far. Today, we will be examining Arbok's effect on the competitive scene, and thus, we ask, how good was Arbok actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Generation 1 was dominated by Psychic types, and many Pokemon without Psychic packed Earthquake. Thus, it may not come as a surprise that Arbok was completely unviable. No tier specification needed, because it wasn't any good in any of them. It did possess the infuriating monstrosity that is Gen 1 Rap, but as it turns out, there were superior Poison type Rap users. Rappers, if you will, in OU and UU. OU had Victory Bell, which packed Sleep Powder and a nasty stab auto crit Razor Leaf, while UU had Tentacruel, whose huge speed and special made it one of the faces of the tier. Arbok's meager stats and move pull lacking stabs certainly weren't matching either of those. And you had a mini Victory Bell and Weeping Bell, and it didn't even bother using Rap. So there really was no chance for Arbok even all the way down there. As in the anime, the competitive scene in Generation 1 was not at all kind to Arbok. Just replace Pikachu's Thunderbolt with the litany of Psychics and Earthquakes littered throughout the tiering rung. The second generation gave Arbok a great stab move in Sludge Bomb, whose nasty 30% poison rate could cripple Psychics. Plus, with the splitting of the special stat, its special defense rose to base 79. These were undeniably useful additions, but Arbok needed a lot more if it were to become OU viable. There was also something mocking about it receiving a great poison stab, just as Steel types entered the fray, most of which did not fear its earthquake, even if it was super effective, thanks to Arbok's thoroughly unimpressive attack. Even boosting with Curse couldn't get it very far. Its overall below average stats meant it was not a difficult Pokemon to overwhelm. As such, it was no surprise that Arbok was completely unviable in OU once again. It had no luck in UU either, as the tier was dominated by Psychic types and superior Poison types in Needle Queen, Quillfish, Crobat, and Haunter. Fortunately, Arbok was able to find a niche in the significantly depowered Crept NU, where its stats were much more impressive. It was not one of the tier's defining Pokemon, but it had a lot of good going for it. First, it was a strong offensive threat. There were not many resists to its sludge bomb, nor did most neutral targets have the bulk to withstand it comfortably, especially with the high poison rate and potential boost from Curse. The few Pokemon that did resist it, such as Weezing, Dugtrio, Magnemite, and Sudowoodo, were either crippled by sludge bomb poisons and or hit by an earthquake. Speaking of Weezing, Arbok was unique in that it was not hit super effectively by any of Weezing's coverage moves, while also not being threatened by sludge bomb poisons. In conjunction with its solid special defense, it was a solid check to one of the tier's best Pokemon. Arbok also also had the highly useful trait of capably checking the terrifying primate. Furthermore, Arbok didn't just spread poison, it was also great at spreading paralysis with glare. In fact, glare's paralysis was a significant part of what made Arbok so most unique. Since the move was normal type, it could paralyze ground types such as Dugtrio, giving it an edge over Thunder Wave users. Arbok's main problem was that it had strong poison type competition in the aforementioned top tier Weezing. Gloom was also easier to slap on teams thanks to its recovery in Moonlight, its resistance to water and electric, and its neutrality to Earthquake. Their increased utility meant Arbok was not as automatic an addition to teams as they were. Nevertheless, Arbok was a good Pokemon with a solid niche in GSC and U. Generation 3 blessed Arbok with two useful abilities. Shed Skin, allowing it to passively cure itself of status, and Intimidate, one of the best abilities in the game. It also enjoyed the addition of Choice Ban, which provided a much needed power boost. Now its Sludge Bombs were even more dangerous, and it could dispose of Poison Resist with Earthquake more easily. It wasn't coming anywhere close to the Power Crept OU or UU metagames, but it once again found a niche for itself in NU as an effective wall breaker. It threatened a significant portion of the metagame between its solid blend of power speed and coverage. It scared out common defensive Pokemon like Blossom and threatened the switch in with massive damage and or a crippling sludge bomb poison. With Intimidate and its fighting resistance, Arbok not only had plenty of opportunities to hit the field and threaten damage, but also possessed valuable defensive utility for an offensive Pokemon. It was arguably the best offensive switch against the tier-defining Hitmonchan. Now, while auspicious, Arbok's attributes were not as all-around applicable as those of the metagame staples. Thus, you couldn't slap it on just any team. It also had competition with 
with Golbat as a poison type choice bander. Nevertheless, Arbok was a solid Pokemon with a useful role in the Gen 3 and U metagame. Arbok received some new nice tools in Generation 4. The most immediately striking was its new, more powerful stab, Gunk Shot. It also received useful new coverage options in Seed Bomb and Crutch. Perhaps the most notable, however, was Switcheroo. Now it could hinder an opposing Pokemon by forcing a choice item on them. Sadly, the fourth generation also brought with it immense power creep, and Arbok was too overshadowed to make use of any of its tools. It was only ever given a passing glimpse in UU, as the combination of Intimidate and the Ground Paralyzing Glare seemed interesting, but the severely flawed bulky never turned off, with their lack of recovery being particularly pressing. While choice band sets were too frail without defensive investment, and too weak even with offensive investment and the boost, switcherooing the choice band onto other Pokemon wasn't enough of a reason to use it, especially when it could potentially wind up accidentally giving a band to Rhyperior. Spiritomb entirely outclassed it in such a role. Sadly, Arbok's flaws did not disappear in Enu. Despite the tier's far weaker power level, Arbok was every bit as prominent and exploitable. It wasn't completely unviable, but it certainly was a far cry from good. Essentially, it was a gimmick. Sadly, Arbok was completely unviable in the fourth generation. On the bright side, Ekans had a small role in Generation 4 in Little Cup. It wasn't too good offensively, but it had great utility in the combination of Intimidate and its fighting resistance, which allowed it to stave off the terrifying choice as well as acting as a good point against Machop. Plus, it didn't have to worry about not having a healing move, as Orin Berry would suffice. Ekans also provided decent support with Glare, whose paralysis was big and enabled slower teammates like the terrifying Munchlax. In return, Ekans would devour the fighting type moves aimed at Lax. Ekans' niche was limited and it wasn't a particularly prominent Pokemon as a result, but its niche was unique and worthwhile on occasion. It was a solid offbeat choice in Gen 4 Little Cup. Arbok received a useful boosting move in Coil in Generation 5. In addition to providing the same boost as Bulk Up, this move also raised accuracy, meaning it works perfectly to offset the one drawback of Arbok's Gunk Shot. Arbok also received one of the best priority moves in the game, Sucker Punch, allowing it to pick off frail would-be revenge killers, especially Psychic types. As a bonus, Enyu had plenty of fighting types for this new and improved Arbok to check, and it could stave off several prominent grass types like Sazbuck and Superior as well. So surely, it had a niche, right? Well, technically, yes, Arbok was not the worst thing you could use, but in practice, nobody used it for many good reasons. First of all, Arbok had to choose between an offensive set that wasn't bulky enough to check what it was supposed to, or a passive defensive set that threatened nearly nothing in return and was still a far cry from immovable. Additionally, its offensive set was still not that threatening. There were plenty of Pokemon that outsped it and hit it hard without being fragile enough to crumple to a plus one sucker punch. All in all, one could get much better results using Garbodor as their poison type. Its spikes would damage opposing teams far more reliably than any offense Arbok could muster, as did the passive damage it dished out with Rocky Helmet and Aftermath, just for switching into the threats it was supposed to check, which it was also far better at doing thanks to its vastly superior bulk. Plus, if it really wanted to, Garbodor could be a much more effective offensive Pokemon as well. Using Arbok was just making your life harder for nearly no benefit. As a result, no one did, and Arbok fell to untiered. Sadly, Ekans wasn't able to establish even a small niche in Generation 5 Little Cup. Some players tried to disrupt the tier's Eviolite monotony with a Choice Scarf Switcheroo set, but Ekans was simply too inept both offensively and defensively against nearly the entire tier to warrant its use. It was good against Mianfu, but so were Krogonk and Grimer, and they were useful for more than just that. Thus, Ekans did not see any use in Black and White Little Cup. The 6th generation buffed Arbok both directly and indirectly. The direct buffs were Gunk Shot, having its accuracy improved from 70% to 80%, while Glare was improved to a solid 100%. The indirect buff was the addition of Fairy types, whose stab Arbok resisted while threatening them back with its own super effective stab. The second indirect buff was the addition of the new sub NU lowest tier, PU, and it was here that Arbok was able to find new life in spite of that age old threat, Power Creep. Funnily enough, all of the above tiers had taken most of the fairy types. One of the two remaining in PU was Mr. Mime, whose psychic type antics Arbok wanted no part of. The fairy typing even ensured Mr. Mime was hit neutrally by Sucker Punch. The other fairy type was Clefairy, which Arbok completely destroyed. But as good as Clefairy was, it only fit on bulkier teams, which were not so prominent and dominant that they required potentially obscure answers. So if PU had very little way of commonly abusable fairy types, what made Arbok worthwhile? Simple. The tier was littered with grass types. Arbok feasted on these. It switched into the top tier Leafeon 
as well as Quilladin, Servine, and Simi Sage. And from there, unleashed an offensive assault the tier had a difficult time withstanding safely. It also threatened another grass type in the common defensive staple, Roselia. It absorbed its toxic spikes, massively threatened with gunk shot, and set up in its face. The one grass type Arbok didn't really like switching into was Cacturn, but it was an excellent revenge killer for it, especially since Intimidate would weaken the otherwise vicious Sucker Punch. The tier having as many grass types as it did wasn't just good for Arbok because it threatened them. It loved pairing with them, as it would be able to switch into ground types that annoyed Arbok, such as Golem. Now, Arbok was far from flawless. Despite PU's lower power level, it wasn't that bulky, and it had direct competition with another poison type, who was in the form of Muk. However, Arbok's Intimidate, far higher speed, and stronger priority ensured it was far from outclassed. It saw solid usage, able to fit and deliver on many offensive teams. It required a little care to get optimal results, but Arbok was a solid Pokemon in Oraz PU. Sadly, the PU placement was short-lived for Arbok. The tier was incredibly power crept in Generation 7. Several powerful poison types joined the rank. Victory Bell, Quillfish, and Skunk Tank ranked among the best Pokemon in the tier. Arbok could not keep up with this stronger, faster, bulkier metagame. It struggled to do anything to just about every top tier Pokemon. Some players experimented with Waterium Z sets. Theoretically, it could act as a great lure for Mudsdale and Regirock with a plus one Aqua Tail turned Hydro Vortex. However, its set never took off, as Arbok was simply too useless against nearly the entire metagame and therefore not running. As a result, it dropped to untiered once again. And that's all, folks. So how good was Arbok actually? Well, three things have been consistent in Arbok's competitive career. First, it's not just a lower tier lifer, it's the lowest tier lifer. Second, it's often struggled to find use even in the lowest tiers. In fact, it's been completely unviable in four of the seven generations it's existed in. Third, even when it has found use in those lowest tiers, it has been far from excellent. Its peak has been viability of good to decent. It's a similarly rough story for Ekans in Little Cup. It had a nice underrated niche in Generation 4, but afterwards it was completely unviable and thus disappeared. Arbok is a Pokemon that needs some serious statistical and or move pool buffs to be at all viable again, even in the lowest tier. So hopefully it will receive some of its returns in Generation 8. Thanks for watching everyone, and as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content, and in the comments I want to know what do you think about competitive Arbok, how would you buff it because it really needs it, whatever it is let me know in the comments. Also thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank Thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.